Another lynching has gone down in the U.S. And it's 2011. Nothing has changed. What up, Troy? I can't believe you actually did it, man. To tell the truth, they ain't never gonna kill you, man. You live forever in the hearts of those that fought for you. You fought for us, you gave the strength like a true soldier. I feel the pain, I feel the anger, and the race to show it. I hit the streets and spread the word to the world knows it. I'm sorry we ain't saved you. Should have been braver, but at times I feel alone when I'm surrounded by these strangers. 2009, we first spoke after I met Martina. I got the shirt, but since then I haven't really seen her. Been on the road with these straps. So. I mean, that's to me, that's that's the thing. I mean, I, I've, I've always, you know, um, held on to his journey. And, you know, I, I think the thing that really even inspired me anymore was the day, you know, when you had your address in the back. And I sat down and I wrote you a letter. And I'm like, okay, I've read countless people who speak about injustices. They want to help, but they're going to reach out to you. And then I got the letter back from you, Jen. You know, and it put the biggest this is, you know, and you were like, hey, look, you know, you wrote me, I'm going to reach out to you, you know, I'm going to support you, I'm going to help you, and since that time, you've been in my life kind of pushing my campaign, you know, and so I think it, it's, I think people need to realize that his story, you know, and his people should continue to fight for justice when you see him, you know, and that's why, I'm, I, you know, I've been asking people, you know, just look at my facts. Look at my case. I'm, I'm like Troy. All we want you to do when you're innocent, you just want people to look at the evidence. We're not asking you to believe it. You know, just believe what we're saying. We're saying go to our, go to our cases. Look at our facts. And when you see that something's wrong, we need you to be our voices out there in the public. We need you to go out there and say, hey, look, we're not going to sit back and allow these injustices to take place. Because I've heard countless people who followed the Troy Davis story say that they will not allow that injustice to go uncorrected. And even though he was executed, you can still save the next person because the next person needs your voice to continue these fights for injustices. Because without you all, we will not receive justices. The courts need to know that you all will not ignore the injustices that, that are taking place. You know, and I think, you know, the Troy Davis family, you know, I've, like I said, I've never met him. I've never met him, but I, I appreciate you all so much. And I feel like I've met you all through Jen because she's told me about you all. You know, and like I said, I, I thank everybody who's out there fighting against these injustices that are taking place. Billy, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, it is amazing to hear your voice and to hear those thoughts uh, on every day. It's amazing to hear your thoughts. And on this day, that's really powerful. Yeah. And, I, and like I said, I just, my thing is, like I said, just keep his voice alive by fighting through injustice. If you believe in him, if you love them, every time you see an injustice, fight that injustice and put this is for Troy Davis. That's how you can keep his memory going on. He fought for injustice. His sister fought for injustice. She loved her brother so much. She put everything down to fighting against injustices. And like I said, just I'm asking me personally on a personal level, I ask people to go to my website, you know, see my proof and see that I am Troy Davis. That was the thing everybody was saying, that they are Troy Davis. And I'm telling you, I am Troy Davis. Just go to my site, www.freebillyallen.com, and you can see and I thank you, Jen, for, you know, helping shed light on my situation. I thank all the people and supporters um, who have been supporting me over this time. And like I said, I love you and I appreciate everything you have been continuing to do for me. Thank you, Billy. And thanks for taking, I know you have very few minutes that you can spend, and I really appreciate you using them to, to call. Oh, no problem. But you take care and, like I said, keep fighting for Troy. Keep fighting for him. And we're going to keep fighting for you also, Billy. And, and, All right, thank you. And I just want to read you one, someone saying here, thank you, Billy, for connecting the struggle in prisons with political prison work on the outside. Unite those struggles. So you're having an impact right here. <laughs> what it gave me is that somebody listening. Like I said, I appreciate you all and continue to fight. I mean, we need that. Trust me, it, it means more than you all know. You all are a breath of fresh air because sometimes it feel like we're drowning in this place. Thanks, Billy. Stay safe and well. Right. Uh, so we're, people are wishing you solidarity. 
solidarity with you, Billy. We hear you and we're here for you. From, from you. Um, thank you so much, everyone. First of all, for uh, enduring all the technical difficulties um, and for folks who were able to leave and come back and can now hear. I'm very glad that folks can now hear. I'm hoping my internet stays on. Um, and I didn't get the chance to prepare you uh, that Billy was going to be calling um, and wanted to share some words with all of us. Uh, and like he said, I connected to Billy through Troy's story. And Troy and, and Martina had such an impact on Billy and his sister Yvette, who has been fighting fighting for him. Um, you know, there, there are a handful of events in, in my own life that I realized shaped me so profoundly, both in my understanding of how injustice and white supremacy operates and also in my understanding of what resistance can actually look like and, and what movement building uh, can actually be, movements struggling for liberation. And Troy's execution 10 years ago was absolutely one of those event, events that profoundly shaped um, how I see the world and everything I do in the world um, and, and my analysis of that. And I know that I'm not alone in that, that there's so many people here tonight who were so personally impacted by the struggle um, and by the fight for Troy and by the Davis family about the love that they showed um, in that struggle. And it's beautiful. There's people who are already doing this in the chat, introducing themselves, sharing memories that you might have um, of the fight for Troy, of the ways you were impacted by the fight for Troy. So please, please do continue um, to share those. And yes, um, thanks BK, did drop Billy's website in the chat for people who were wanting to know more about how to support Billy. Um, so please let's continue to use this chat to, to know each other, to build community and to, and to be in revolutionary community together um, as we let the memory of Troy power us in the fight ahead. Um, we have a really full and powerful gathering tonight. We have members of the Davis family who are with us. Um, there's going to be an incredible panel conversation moderated by Amy Goodman, who's the host and producer of Democracy Now! We're going to take a sneak peek um, at, a, at a, about 20 minutes of the I Am Troy Davis documentary film. We just heard from Billy Allen, um, which was so powerful. Uh, there's dozens of organizations and, and thousands of people um, who, who came together to fight for Troy and to support the Davis family. Um, and a few of those organizations are helped make it made tonight this commemoration possible. So I just wanna express my deep gratitude to Eighth Amendment Project, Amnesty International USA, Death Penalty Action, Equal Justice USA, FTP Movement, Haymarket Books, Highlander Research and Education Center, and the Movement for Black Lives, who are our co-sponsors for tonight. And of course, Democracy Now. Um, and I'm here representing the sponsoring organization, uh, Donkey Saddle Projects. We are a small and scrappy organization that uses art and storytelling in the service of social justice, equity, liberation, and of course, abolition. Um, I'm incredibly honored to have the opportunity to introduce you to Kimberly Davis. Troy's sister, who I consider also a sister to me. Um, Kim and the entire Davis family have been absolute warriors uh, in the struggle for justice for Troy, but for countless of others. And Kim's, your unflagging faith and, and your centering of love and family um, inspire me each and every day. And um, I know Kim wants to say a few words of welcome to everyone. And uh, I couldn't be, I couldn't have a better partner in justice uh, than my sister, Kim Davis. Thank you, June Marlo. Um, thank you, panel guests and everyone that's on. Um, on behalf of the family, we would like to say thank you, everyone, for your continued fight throughout the struggle for these past 10 years. Um, it's, it's been a long road and, you know, we're getting through this um, one day at a time. We asked, um, we were talking the other day, um, me and Kalanji, and we were saying about the difference with mobilizing and organizing. Uh, through the movement for Troy Davis to save Troy's life, I mean, we have people from all over the world, um, all walks of life that joined us together for the innocence of my brother. Um, and what we need to continue to do, we just need all need to continue 
to fight, to continue to stay together. We have so many different organizations that are out there. We're fighting for the same cause, but it's, it's different organizations. And we get together and mobilize and become one organization. We mobilize and organize and become one organization to fight for this death penalty. We will be more powerful because with that fist, you can take down many things with that fist and we'll be more powerful. And I just ask y'all to continue to pray for me and my family as we continue to um, fight for justice. We're gonna continue to fight with Billy Allen. We're gonna continue to fight with each and every guy that's on death row. And, you know, we're just asking God, you know, just to continue to walk with us as we go through this journey, but we are going to end this death penalty. And I just want to thank everyone for what you have done thus far, what you have done in the past, and what you're going to do in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Kimberly. Um, and I encourage folks to really be scrolling through the chat as, as we're hearing tonight. People are sharing such... Um, powerful reflections and memories. So I encourage you to, to read and, and share with each other. Um, in the summer of 2019, the Trump administration announced uh, three execution dates after a 17 year hiatus of federal executions. Um, and it was to take place that December. And I remember Kim, I don't know if you remember, I, I called you up a day or two after that announcement was made to ask, you know, to brainstorm with you about what we could do in response. Um, and the idea we came up with, uh, so we, we had a screenplay that was written by Philip Montgomery, uh, who adapted from the book, I'm Troy Davis, which I had helped Troy and Martina write. And we decided to produce a staged reading of the screenplay as a form of um, theatrical protest. But we instinctively knew that the, the right idea was not inviting a bunch of actors to come in and perform the screenplay but instead to invite those who understood the Davis family's struggle um, inside and out better than anyone else could. Uh, so we reached out to, to death row survivors, um, to people with family members on death row, folks whose loved ones were murdered by police or in acts of racial violence, um, knowing that who, who could better tell Troy's story than, than those most impacted by by not only the death penalty, but, but how the death penalty is the sharp edge of an entire system of state violence. Um, so whether it was at the hands of the cops um, or at the hands of the criminal punishment system. Uh, so their performance, which happened the night before what, what the first scheduled federal execution, which was delayed, but as we know, the Trump administration went out um, with a whole spate of um, horrific federal executions. Um, so the performance was the night before the first scheduled one. Uh, and it became the basis of a documentary film that we're currently editing. It's, it's currently in production. Y'all are going to be the very first people to watch um, an excerpt of it. It is rough. It is not finished. Um, Dominic Stewart, shout out to Dominic Stewart, who was uh, working on editing this excerpt until midnight last night and then was back at it at seven this morning. That's how new it is. Um, but uh, it seemed the, like no better time to share a little window into this new way we're trying to um, amplify and elevate Troy's story in order for it to connect so many stories. And like Kim said, as a way to connect these struggles and as a way to connect this resistance. Um, so we're really excited to share a 20 minute excerpt of this work in progress. crisis with food, water, fuel, and medical supplies running out as forces loyal to toppled leader Muammar Gaddafi attempt to hold off interim government troops, but stop short early Monday as rebels began to fire on the town. Thousands of people packed the Jonesville Baptist Church in Savannah, Georgia, Saturday for the funeral of Troy Anthony Davis. The state of Georgia executed Davis last month for the murder of a police officer, despite widespread doubt about his guilt. Seven of the nine witnesses who originally testified against Davis later recanted or changed their testimony. Speakers at Saturday's funeral included Benjamin Jealous, president of the NAACP. Troy's last words that night where he told us to keep on fighting, keep on fighting till his name is finally cleared and Georgia admits what Georgia has done.
Dejan pushes Martina into the main hall where hundreds of supporters and journalists are gathered. Benjamin hands her the microphone. The mic exchanges feedback as the room quiets. Troy said that this fight did not begin with him and this movement should not end with him. Because if we can amass millions of people to stand up and say, we will not stand for this, then we can end the death penalty. Now, I've been battling cancer for 10 years, but the effects of chemo have taken their toll. Several months ago, I was doing fine. And after that, I couldn't get up out of this chair. But I'm here to tell you. I'm here to tell you. That I'm going to stand here for my brother today. Mama. Martina slowly, unsteadily rises from her chair. Dejan and Lester try to help. She darts them a piercing stare. They stand back. No matter what happens tonight, my brother lives because I am. I am. Troy Davis. You are Troy Davis. We are Troy Davis. Laughs, hugs, and tears. Something is happening. It's gone out of the Oh my God! Martina catches the legal assistant handing Benjamin Jones a piece of paper in the midst of his Democracy Now! interview. There are rumors of a stay. The crowd is in a frenzy. I just received from the lawyers, and I want to be clear. He says that Troy, is, Troy has not been executed yet, but that there is also not confirmation of a stay. This is not a stay. The U.S. Supreme Court has asked for a temporary delay as they review the case. And so we are waiting again. We don't know whether we're here for a miracle or a funeral. But for the moment, Troy is with us. We are in a holding pattern. I'm in this space because I think the death penalty uh, is the sharpest edge of the prison industrial complex. Um, Troy Davis was also the case that radicalized me when I was in college. He's the reason why I do this work today. You gotta retire. You don't retire from social justice activities. As long as there's injustice, we gotta fight to go on. It just goes to show just how important that we must stay in this battle to bring about real systemic change. I'm here to give uh, my all, and I'm sure everyone else here is, and let's do it. I Am Troy Davis by Philip Montgomery, based on the book by Jen Marlowe and Martina Davis Correa and Troy Anthony Davis. Act 1, Scene 1, September 21st, 2011, 11.08 p.m. So also, if there are moments as we look through the script today where we missed one of the characters, where we missed one of the characters, um, we'll adjust that um, in the moment, but hopefully this is everything. It's like 62 <laughs> speaking parts. All right, whenever you're ready. So John is supposed to be a blonde hair guy, right? Is that right? <laughs> My hair is, is that right? So I got to kind of play white then. I didn't shoot any police officer. Martina steadies her brother. All right then. Martina leads her brother to the back seat. Six from both shootings show similar casings, and we believe they were fired from the same gun. So right now, I want you to just sit with all the things that we've talked about today. What's on your spirit or your heart? Anger. Anger. Sad. Sadness. Sadness, fear. So my name is Cheryl Brown. I'm a community organizer. I've been working around anti-black state violence for about a little part, of, a little more than a decade. 
I was radicalized by Troy Davis' execution that happened in 2011. I was a student organizer at the time. Troy Davis uh, was wrongfully incarcerated uh, for a murder of McPhail, Officer McPhail. It was a actual frenzy the next day, a manhunt. It was very much like racialized messaging out there about thugs, uh, uh, both in Atlanta and down in Savannah. Um, so it seemed like the folks there were like bloodthirsty to put this, um, to put the death of Mark McPhail onto to someone's lab and Troy Davis was the name that was offered. Virginia gets out and approaches a group of neighbors huddled by the police barricade. She realizes they are surrounding her house. What in heaven? They're looking for Troy. For Troy? Why? So previously I had been doing a lot of work around just broader abolition. And so I reached out to Jen who was like, hey, we're actually doing this stage reading of I, I Am Troy Davis and we really want to engage a lot of family members who've experienced loss uh, to state violence either by hands of the cops or having loved ones being caged inside. Uh, some folks who've been exonerated from death row. I know that all of you are bringing in histories and stories um, and powerful lessons and folks into this space when you come into this room. My name is Sabrina Butler. I'm the first woman exoneree to be exonerated from death row. I was sentenced to death at 17 years old um, for the murder of my son. My name is Dwayne Carr. Um, I'm the mother of Eric Garner, who was murdered in New York City by the police. He was the one who said, I can't breathe 11 times. And I believe that it's important to be here so we can show support for others, so we can be a voice for others who doesn't have a voice. My name is, it took me a long time to say my name a few minutes ago because it's Delia Maria Castro Perez Meyer. Mexican people have a lot of names. <laughs> and I have an innocent brother on Texas's death row and his name is Luis Castro Perez. I met um, Suja Graham when I was working. Uh, he was like going through his fourth trial, third and fourth trial in California coming off a of death row. She kind of took my story by her. <laughs> <laughs> I had a different story. <laughs> my, my I'm happy to be here. My name is Suja. I'm, I'm a survivor. I don't consider myself a victim. I've survived four trials. I was convicted in 1973 for something that I didn't do, and for the next seven years I had to fight for my life. I'm here today not because of the system. I'm here today in spite of the system. I think Troy's case has really exposed the death penalty in the South, the racism, the recantation, the coercion, the, the witnesses, how they've been treated. No physical evidence, no DNA, no gun. But it shows that Georgia still wants to hide this untruth by pushing forward with the execution. But so I went to Savannah, Georgia, to help my team. It was a tough thing to experience in trying to help, but she always gave you a sense of strength in spite of what she was experiencing personally. She used her brother's case to shed light on the injustice that was going on, not just in the state of Georgia, but throughout America. And Troy, it was many more Troys. He was just one among many American young blacks. My name is Sujai Graham. I'm a death row survivor. I spent over 11 years of my life in prison. I came to prison when I was 18 years old. I was given a life sentence. On November 27, 1973, an uprising occurred, and a prison guard was murdered. Myself and Legene Allen, for the next seven years, we had to fight for our life. I was convicted and sentenced to die at San Quentin. And after being on San Quentin's death row for over two to three years, the Supreme Court of California overturned my conviction. I was tried a third time, and again, all white jury, they couldn't determine my guilt or innocence. And it was there in my fourth trial that I was acquitted. And I walked out of prison a free man. Not mentally free, but physically I was able to walk out of prison. And I've been fighting that battle ever since I left prison. A jury only took a few hours to decide he was guilty of murdering a police officer in Savannah, Georgia. A few more hours to decide on lethal injection. The government picks up the case. 
they act as the people uh, and they say that they are there to get justice. They're bent on justice through punishment, not justice through seeking the truth. The district attorney had a chance to have a retrial and just so he didn't look bad, they decided to continue to let this man linger on death row, even though they knew there was a chance he was innocent. In the murder of my, the murder of my son, I had the opportunity to do just what I was talking to you about. They asked me as the victim's family, did I want to go for the death penalty because it was first degree murder, okay? And I decided I didn't want the death penalty. This is not an innocence project like it is for some of you in you know, Billy's case. This guy admitted to doing what he did. So it's not like it was a question. He said, I shot him. Jordan Davis in a car shouting at me, not turning his music down. I got a gun. I can see they have nothing, but I got to shoot into the car 10 times because I don't know what they're going to do. Oscar Grant is at the BART station on his belly, handcuffs behind him. Shoot him in the back. Why? Because he might have done something. He, you just never know what they're going to do. Trayvon Martin, oh, you don't know what he's going to do. I have the gun. He's a kid. All he's got is Skittles and iced tea. But I don't know what he's going to do, so I got to shoot him. Eric Garner, we got to choke him out because he might have been selling cigarettes. I don't know what he's going to do. Every case is, I don't know what they're going to do. And you know they're subhuman. You know they have no value. So let's kill him and talk about it later. Crimes such as what happened to my son, Jordan Davis, it, it tears your body in two, it tears your heart in two. You know, the things that I thought were important become unimportant. The laughter that you have from time to time, shorter. The things that you look forward to are different. I looked at Jordan for getting his first apartment, getting his first car get married, and all those things that you see in the future that you want for him is dashed away. A quarter of the people in this world is locked up right here in the United States. Because we're willing to accept murder and killing as long as the bottom line is somebody gets paid. As long as the Congress, as long as the senators get their campaign contributions, we're willing to accept murder of our family members across this nation. Next on the witness stand, Ben Gordon, the teenager interrogated earlier. Mr. Gordon, can you positively identify the shooter in this courtroom? Ben shakes his head in a haze. Mr. Gordon? Ben gives a half-hearted point to Troy. Thank you. A police officer escorts Harriet Murray into the courtroom. Can you identify the murderer here today? Answering Lawton with little poise of conviction or conviction, Harriet points to Troy. A young black man in his 20s, Sylvester Red Coles, is escorted into the room. Martina makes a point of keeping eye contact. Red rakes eyes with her before looking the other way. Seven uh, out of uh, nine eyewitnesses uh, later recanted their testimony, uh, many of them saying that they were coerced uh, and intimidated by the police. One of them, one of the witnesses even said that uh, Sylvester Cole, quote unquote, Red, who was the person who offered Troy Davis's name, um, was the person who killed Officer Mark McVeigh. You know, we were told that when the death penalty exists, don't worry, there's so much due process that, you know, innocent people don't get executed. And you find out very easily and very quickly after diving through some of the cases around it that that's not the case. Take those words that you just poured out into the room and I want you to come write it on the scroll. Something resonates with you, you can speak it out loud. The love, anger, and pain. Mm -hmm. I wrote Confess Red because I still feel even after the death of Troy Davis, but Red to confess today or tomorrow would help his family so much. <clears throat> All of us in here has been through something traumatic. And yet, when you smiled this morning, when, when we was talking, 
It brought life, you know what I'm saying? We gotta do something, and I'm not finna die, man. I enjoy my life, I enjoy the trees, I enjoy this. I'm going I, I live in bliss, and that's, that's just the way it is, because I feel that it'll kill you inside if you hold all of that. You know what I'm saying? So I release it, I release it. That's so true. I got to meet several people that like really opened up my world to a different kind of injustice. There's a lot of camaraderie. There's stories that you relate to people because they've been there. There's a time in the residency, maybe by day two or three, where family members are starting to make connections between their own stories and the story of Troy, or their own stories and each other's. And they say, hey, there's a playbook here, clearly, that the system uses, where they vilify our child, my brother, my loved one, right? They dehumanize them to make them seem whatever treatment is coming is justified and deserved. That their murder, their execution was justified and deserved. The fact that they've been in solitary confinement for 23 hours out of a 24 hour day is justified and deserved. That the death penalty for the worst of the worst is justified and deserved. In terms of our, our reaction and our, our responses to having someone in our family harmed or hurt or killed, <coughs> right? We got to look at the nature of our society. That everything we see is, a, is based upon an eye for an eye to seek vengeance. It is a serious situation what we all been through. Mm -hmm. We just got to live and appreciate every day because like you all almost lost your life. My son lost his life. So let's all of us appreciate, you know, the little things. But what was beautiful here in this experience is that it wasn't just families who've lost loved ones to police violence in the street. It was also affirming and loving of people who had folks who were locked up on the inside. And so seeing the families love upon each other like that, to support each other, to say, hey, I see you. I see the playbook. So we have to be building together as well. It's really dope. You have a family who loves you and a sister who won't stop until your name is clear. If someone hits you, you turn the other cheek, and she's right. But Uncle Troy, I only have two cheeks, and he keeps hitting me. <laughs> someone stop him! Troy tries to block another blow from Red, but Dee Dee pulls him away. Red lifts his gun to McPhail's head. No hesitation. Bang! The kill shot. No one was inside. And if he was, y'all would have just shot him down like he was a dog in the street. The way I see it, Justice can fall into the trap of thinking it's more powerful than the truth. And when it does, it degenerates into something twisted. It brings out the worst than who we are. I'll never stop believing that we can change this. We can fight the wrongs. Because I am Tri-Davis! And thank you so much for being the very first people to watch um, a 20 minute work in progress of what will be a full documentary film. Um, it was really moving to watch it knowing that actually uh, several of the people who you were watching in the film clip are, are with us in this Zoom room today. And um, deep appreciation and love Aisha, I know you're with us. Uncle Ron, I know that you're with us. Delia, of course, we're going to be hearing from you on the panel in a few moments. Um, at the end of this um, evening, we're going to be dropping a link to a, to a feedback form. Uh, we would love to get your thoughts on what you saw of the film. That will help us as we're continuing to develop it. And, and of course, uh, you'll be invited to stay in touch with us um, on the journey of completing the film. Uh, and hopefully we'll be among the first to be able to see uh, the finished film. Uh, I do want to mention the film, of course, is based on the book uh, that Troy and Martina wrote that I had the immense um, sacred privilege of getting to help them with. Um, that book is being offered tonight uh, just for, for, for those of us remembering Troy um, at a 40% discount by the, the publisher Haymarket Books is, um, 
is allowing uh, offering a 40% discount for folks who have not had the chance to, to read the book yet. Um, so my colleague VK is going to drop the link um, to for you to be able to to know how to get that um, and to go directly to the publisher for that. Um, before we turn to the panel conversation, I, I want to share a message from Troy's cousin, Elijah West. Um, Elijah and I were chatting over Facebook today, and, and he had some words that he wanted to share with y'all. He wrote, um, these last 10 years have been very hard on our family and on our family. Georgia made a huge mistake. This is one that they will have to live with for the rest of their lives. And 2011 was very hard. We buried three family members in all that same year. And he's talking, of course, about Troy, Troy's mother, Virginia, uh, and Martina. Uh, we buried three family members all in that same year, and that was very hard. And me and my family would like to thank all the supporters and the extended family members that we have. Thank you, Elijah. Um, Elijah, thank you for being with us tonight. And um, like we were chatting about on Facebook, I hear and see that you are wanting and ready to stand up and to speak out and to re-engage um, in the struggle and in activism. And, and you know I'm going to be tapping you um, quite regularly uh, <laughs> with, um, with what will hopefully be meaningful opportunities uh, to connect with you in that fight. And I love you. Um, you know, there's, there's so much that I would like to say about the deep and lasting impact that Troy has had on us and on the world, um, but we're about to hear from some people who will be able to say it much, much more powerfully than I could, and certainly more succinctly. Um, and one thing I'd be curious about, you know, in, in the chat box, um, drop the letters DN in the chat box if Democracy Now! was how you first learned about Troy Davis. I would just be interested to hear, see for how many that was true. Just write DN in the chat box if you first came to Troy's story through Democracy Now. I'm seeing a lot of people. <laughs> a lot of people are um, are dropping that in the chat box. And that was true for me also. In 2007, I was watching an interview on Democracy Now with this incredibly powerful woman, Martina davis Correa. I actually think it's a piece of that interview that we just saw in the film. And she was talking about her brother, Troy Davis, who had just survived an execution date by 23 hours. Um, and it's really no coincidence that so many of us came to Troy's case through Amy Goodman and Democracy Now! coverage because they were telling Troy's story. They were covering the case long before any of them, any other media was covering the case. Um, and on that night, um, on September uh, 21st, 2011, Amy was broadcasting live for hours and hours that entire long traumatic night from the prison yard. Many of us in this Zoom room together was were there in the prison yard um, as Amy, watching Amy uh, broadcast that and, and were, were a part of that experience. And, and many of us saw Amy a, a week later at Troy's funeral and then two months later at Martina's funeral. Um, I can't think of a better person to lead what's going to be such a rich and, and exciting and um, insightful conversation. And I'm so happy to welcome uh, Amy Goodman, who is the host and executive producer of Democracy Now! for what I know will be a really powerful discussion. Thank you, Amy. Oh, well, thank you so much, Jen. And thank you to all the hundreds of people who are tuning in right now and especially to our panelists. It was an honor this morning to be interviewing uh, Kimberly Davis, uh, Troy's sister, um, as we remembered Troy and Martina, uh, also speaking with Ben Jealous at the time, he was head of the NAACP, now head of People for the American Way. But what a moment that was 10 years ago. And, as so many people have pointed out, while Troy may have been executed that night, his legacy, the anti-death penalty movement today, um, is such an important engine for racial justice. I mean, when I went down, it was a few days after Occupy Wall Street. This is the 10th anniversary. And so many people marched into Zuccotti Park holding up a sign that said, I am Troy Davis. So we followed that trajectory from Occupy to Atlanta to Jackson. 
and did not know what would happen that night. Had no idea as a thousand more House and Spellman students didn't know, as the family of Troy didn't know, as people from around the world who gathered there and then through Democracy Now! watched in St. Mary's Church in Harlem and in libraries and colleges, they gathered around their laptops. Um, how critical it was, how much people cared at seven, that moment of jubilation when someone thought, my God, the death warrant, the fourth one had been vacated, but then realizing in fact, it wasn't true. Clarence Thomas, the Supreme Court Justice was the point man for the Supreme Court who hailed from Pinpoint, Georgia, not far from Savannah where Troy grew up. Um, Pinpoint, Georgia, a community founded by freed slaves. And then at 1053, that tragic moment um, when we heard that Troy was being executed. And 1108, the statement came out that he had died and today on Democracy Now! and you see in the film, the reporters coming out and talking about Troy's last words, uh, saying to the McPhail family, I am not the person who did this. I did not have a gun. <clears throat> saying to his reporters, to his family, to his lawyers, please continue to fight the fight. And then turning to his executioners and saying, God have mercy on your souls. God bless your souls. Tonight, we're gonna to remember Troy and talk about the movement that um, he was so important in building the movement against the death penalty um, for abolition in this country. And we're gonna start with Dejan, Dejan Davis Correa. Um, who was a youth leader against Troy's execution, who went on to Morehouse College and graduated in 2019, and now has become an engineer and an entrepreneur. Um, Dejan, if you can tell us about your memories of Troy, you had the unusual experience of growing up, um, visiting your uncle in that prison, and what his life and death has meant to you today. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, as she said, my name is Dijon, uh, the nephew of Troy Anthony Davis. Um, growing up with Troy, everything was from, in a way, normal, if that's even a word uh, to use in this sense. Um, but at the same time, um, I understood what Troy was at a younger age, and from a young age, I was able to, you know, really do uh, my research, do everything I needed to do um, to understand why he was where he was and to uh, find my place to figure out how I can help the situation. Um, and with that being said, um, while, you know, he spent his 22 years on death row, um, I didn't come into play until probably like, I think, what, year four of him being um, in jail or something like that. But um, he was like a, a second father to me, um, always there with homework. Now I'm always there with just, you know, someone I can talk to, someone um, that would just, you know, understood how it was to, you know, grow up as a you know, young black male in general. Um, we never, we never really talked a lot about him being in prison, in the prison system, um, obviously, because I was just, you know, it really wasn't the mood of the conversations to talk about him being in there. But um, we, you know, like I said, did a lot of fun things. Um, we wrote quarters of people who've been in prison systems, uh, visitation, they know what that is. Um, made paper planes out of uh, the Reese's Cups, uh, cardboard that used to be in the bottom. Uh, so did a lot of different things um, while, you know, he was in, you know, prison. And at the same time, I was able to learn a lot from him because uh, Troy had a lot of wisdom, had a lot of knowledge, uh, had a lot of experience uh, with him um, throughout his life and things that he'd been through. So, you know, just picking his brain from there and learning, you know, from him and who he was uh, helped mold me who I am. And I mean, fast forward to today, um, the... I just my relationship with him alone, uh, I would say 
outside of him even being in prison, I believe he would have still had the same um, relationship and connection um, there just from an intellectual standpoint. And, you know, having that person, a person like that in your lifestyle, uh, especially, you know, your mother and your grandmother being that type of person uh, that, you know, you can connect with on an intellectual way, have deep conversations with and things of that nature. Um, they're a lot, at the same time, you're able to be able to uh, have people pour a lot of information in you, uh, which you can hold to a certain part of your life where you may need. Um, and, you know, now that I'm getting older and things of that nature and in my career field and, you know, doing business and stuff, a lot of things that they taught me that didn't really resonate with me as I was coming up, um, it started hitting me at certain parts of my life. Uh, and that's with a lot of different information um, that just randomly hits me and I'm just like, hmm. Okay, so that's what that was for. That's what, you know, this life lesson is about. So um, just fast forward, like I said, the 10 plus years, um, things have been going really well um, for me personally and my family. We've been doing really good. Um, haven't really, we haven't, you know, been, um, I would say some people feel as though, and I don't mean this in any district, but some people feel as though, you know, we've been kind of, you know, sad and things of that nature. Granted, the situation was sad, but at the same time, we're a resilient family. We understand that, you know, we have a support system around us. Um, and, you know, we still have to continue to fight the fight and help the next person that's coming next. Um, and so, you know, everything has been going pretty well. Um, and we as a family have been doing well. We're staying strong and continue to fight each day, day in and day out. Well, I'm really glad you're here tonight, Dejan. I also want to introduce Tenji Wei McCarris, who is a leader in the movement for Black Lives who was deeply involved in the fight for Troy Davis's life. Tenji Wei, if you can talk about how you came to this struggle. Sure, um, thank you, Amy. And just, I just first wanna um, just say how humbled I am just to be here with you all. And first, I just wanna say so much love and respect to, the, to this family. Um, Troy Davis's family is, one of the reasons why I feel like I am the organizer that I am today. Uh, they not just showed us that we should be deeply outraged by a system that would kill their loved one, but they awakened us to how important and how profound it is to center at any movement love, like how much we are willing to fight for our loved ones. So I just wanna just share a lot of love and respect to the family. Um, I was introduced through to, to the Troy Davis campaign and efforts to, to, to prevent his execution while I was working um, at Amnesty International. And actually there's a lot of um, old uh, uh, comrades and, and colleagues who, at Amnesty International who worked at that campaign. And um, I, I worked under the leadership of, of folks like Laura Moy who were organizing to prevent the execution, but also organizing um, around abolition of the death penalty. Um, and so that's how, how, how I came to, to the case. And a lot of my work was focused around mobilizing folks in New York City, particularly leading up, up to the execution um, of, about 10 years ago. Um, and, and like a lot of folks have said, um, between Jen, um, uh, Billy that spoke earlier and, uh, and others, and I'll, I'll share more earlier, you know, Troy Davis's, uh, Troy, not just the execution, but who Troy Davis was, every word that he spoke, um, every word from the family members, from Martina Correa Davis to Virginia Davis, to all the family members on this call, um, inspired, I, I believe, millions of people and not just helped contribute to where the, 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 death, the, the, the movement to abolish the death penalty is today, but contribute to so many movements um, who, who are dedicated to transforming and changing and shifting away from a country that chooses to kill as opposed to giving communities what we need. And so um, I'm, I'm looking forward to going into just how deep and profound the legacy of Troy Davis and the legacy of his family um, is to, to movement work in this country and also around the world. We're also joined by uh, Delia Perez Meyer, who is the sister of Luis Castro Perez, Castro Perez, uh, who's fighting to prove his innocence on Texas death row. Delia, if you can talk about the influence of Troy's life and death um, on your brother and um, what's happening with him right now. Okay. Well, thank you very much for having me. And it's just an honor and a blessing to be here with all of you. I have, I'm just amazed by um, 
just everything that we have seen and heard so far. And Amy, thank you for all the work that you have done over the years. Um, I came to the Troy Davis uh, movement um, in around 2007, by the way, of uh, the campaign to end the death penalty. So we had the national campaign to end the death penalty that was um, uh, in uh, Chicago. So we had several uh, conferences there. And um, I was talking a little bit this morning about the fact that I had to share a room um, with uh, Troy's sister. And I was so amazed by her perseverance and her strength and her faith and her dedication. And it truly inspired me to stand up and shift my thinking about how I was going about trying to save my own brother's life. And um, I just remember well that she was still very ill going through her cancer treatments, but she would get up so bright and early in the morning and start ironing her clothes and getting ready for the day. And um, it just really touched my heart that she was uh, such a fighter. And it gave me uh, ammunition, uh, you know, it, to fight for my own brother. And uh, it did have a huge impact on myself and on my brother to Lewis. And I will never, I will never forget that. And, um, you know, I loved her very much as a sister. We became very close just in those few days that we were together in Chicago. And, um, and then, of course, um, you know, as the fight continued for Troy, um, we would go to Washington, D.C. each year for the Fast and Vigil. And so we got to be, uh, you know, with the family and with the movement. And uh, it was very inspirational and their tireless efforts and just amazing to watch the whole world come forward for Troy. Um, just the, the galvanizing of, of the whole world coming forward for him um, was simply amazing. And, uh, and it had a huge impact on all of us and on everybody on Texas's death row because they knew that we were out here fighting not only for Troy, but for you know so many others. At that time, um, we were fighting for Stan Tookie Williams, Kevin Cooper, uh, the Chicago Ten, um, that were the guys that had been tortured uh, by um, uh, was it John Burge, I believe his name was. Um, and then, of course, you know Texas. We've had 577 executions, and so. It just inspired us to uh, to work harder and to work smarter, and um, it just had a huge impact on my life. So we've also just been joined by the great Mark Lamont Hill um, from Philadelphia, um, who is a, a television personality, who is an author, who is an activist. Talk about the execution of Troy Anthony Davis, his life and then his death and where you were 10 years ago. And, you know, we talked about three days before Occupy started. So many people carried signs that said, I am Troy Davis and then Troy was executed. Yeah, you know, it was, um, and, and thank you all for joining me, Amy. It's always good to see you. I, uh, it, I can't believe 10 years have passed. I remember, you know, we were, you know, I come out of a, a Philadelphia where, you know, the campaign to free uh, Mumi Abu Jamal has been going on for decades. And so we were prepared for long distance running. We were prepared for the kind of protracted battles it takes to fight the state when it comes to the death penalty. And right around the time that Troy was, was killed by the state, I was part of um, a big media push to bring even more awareness to it. I, what made this case special for me, along with uh, Tupi Williams, was that there was a new generation of people who were just being made aware of how the death penalty functions in such brutal, inhumane, dishonest, racist fashion. I remember going on BET's 106 in Park when it was still um, when it was still on, 
And, you know, I'm talking, I think it was uh, Roxy and Terrence at the time, or uh, uh, yeah, and, uh, or maybe, yeah, and, and we were talking about, um, in, in giving basic data about why the death penalty is inhumane, but also why the case against Troy Davis is specifically, specifically wrong, right? Whether it's, it's, it's people who change their testimony, whether it's reports that were inaccurate, whether it was uh, the dishonesty of the process, all of it was evidence that this needs to stop. And in many ways, it was one of the most inspirational moments um, of my life as an activist, because I watched uh, as social media was, was getting traction, people were really falling in love with Twitter, as people were using all these mechanisms to say, I am Troy Davis, as you mentioned in Occupy, we saw the kind of intersectional energy of people um, understanding that we can't have a sophisticated conversation about challenging capitalism if we're also not going to talk about other ways that the state wields violence against us, including the death penalty, that that also is connected to abolition, that it's also connected to schools. And, and so when I saw people holding the I am Troy Davis signs, I was inspired. I was inspired by all of these movements. And so for me at that time, I remember uh, communicating with folk, but trying to go on every media outlet possible to bring black people into this conversation so that the anti-death penalty conversation wasn't seen as a white liberal cause you know, that it wasn't lumped into a kind of Occupy moment, but that they understood why it was important for us to be in that conversation. Um, and, and finally, I also remember um, the extraordinary pain, the extraordinary sense of loss um, that we all felt for the family uh, for whom we still grieve. Um, but I also watched a generation, a new cadre of wide-eyed, energetic, uh, optimistic, maybe even idealistic act Activists real, realize that this ain't about innocence. This isn't about being right. That there are so many other factors that go into whether or not the state is going to exercise its unjust, immoral power to kill its citizens or not. And, and so for some of us that created inspiration to fight more, for others, it created a great sense of disillusionment that we're still fighting against after Tukey and after Troy and after so many others. And so uh, I, I never forgot that moment uh, where it was announced that he'd passed um it was very painful very difficult to swallow um and um yeah we we, we fight on well uh in addition to mark we're joined by kalanji jamashanga who is a well-known activist um my puppy i'm sorry is uh getting excited and wants to join in too organizer and author whose organization ftp movement was active in the fight for troy um Tanji, if you could talk about um, how you got involved and what this night 10 years later means to you, where you feel the movement is today. Sure. T tell your dog, I don't want no problems. Um, <laughs> yeah, so <laughs> it's number one. He's quiet till I came on the scene. <laughs> nah, so um, I, I first uh, was turned on to uh, Troy's case on... Uh, July 9th, 2007, I got a uh, phone call from one of my OGs, um, who's a veteran uh, Panther, veteran Black Panther by the name of Daruba Ben Wahad. And he asked me, he said, uh, uh, what are y'all doing down there for that, uh, for that young brother on death row? And I'm like, what are you talking about? And he said, uh, it's a brother they looking to execute. He said, man, what's wrong with you, man? You ain't on top of your thing. That's how he talk. He said, it's a brother that we looking to execute. I mean, they're looking to execute uh, next week. So I said, man, I ain't up on it. So he said that he was gonna hook me up, connect me with another um, OG. And when we say OG, we mean original gorilla, um, or some folks say elders, um, by the name of uh, Kazi uh, Tori up in Boston. And he said that he knew a sister down there that was working um, with the family or, or knew the family, whatever the case. So he put us in contact. The sister name was Alita Torre. <clears throat> so um, I called her or she called me. That was on that Monday, same day. And I asked her, you know, well, what was going on down there? And she told me that, uh, you know, you're scheduled to be executed uh, the following week. And I said, well, what are you guys doing about it? And she said, uh, you know, well, you know, there's some meetings and so on and so forth. But it didn't really sound like, you know, like, she was kind of in the know of what was, or if there was things that was actually going on on the ground at that particular moment. Um, so I asked her, uh, I said, man, well, you know, we got to do something. And she said, well, um, what can we do? You're in Atlanta. I said, man, if you can get a venue, we can uh, 
you know, get some folks to come down, organize. Uh, maybe you can get in touch with the family. I don't know the family, whatever. And, you know, maybe we can make some noise and, and see, you know, if we can organize something, you know, to save this man's life. You know, we still got time. So um, she got this venue at Sacred Heart Church. Uh, I believe it's on Bull Street or something like that in uh, Savannah. And uh, it's a Catholic church, I believe. And uh, that was that Wednesday. She called me and um, we helped to organize something for that Saturday. And that is where I met uh, a number of the youth, uh, Elijah, you know, shout out to Elijah West. You know, he was one of the, the youth that was there. Um, and the one thing that, uh, you know, it was a number of different speakers and, you know, but the one thing that stood out was Alita had wrote on these t-shirts, uh, uh, this is Troy Davis, I am Troy Davis and a number of other different slogans. And uh, I believe, uh, that might have been, and you all can correct me if I'm wrong, the first time that, you know, uh, <clears throat> that slogan was uh, seen. And um, it was my understanding that uh, uh, Martina and uh, and the folks at Amnesty, they, they, they dug that idea and, you know, the rest was history on that. Um, I know I got the call, that was on a Saturday, July 14th. Um, I remember it was raining that day. The next day, that Sunday, I got a call from Martina and she told me she was out of town and, you know, she was thanking us for trying to do the part. And I'm like, man, that's cool. You know, I really like to, you know, help out a little bit more. And um, I believe it was a Monday or Tuesday. I know Kim would know better than I do. I'm, I'm getting kind of old. But um, uh, there was a meeting, I believe, at the Pardons and Parole Board. And I believe that was the first time he got the stay of execution uh, in Atlanta. So that's where I met Martina. And from there, you know, Martina and I we became cool and we would talk and clown and all kinds of stuff. She would call me by my government name. I call her by a middle name. And, you know, she introduced me to the folks down in in uh, Savannah, Lil Dejan. He was about uh, two feet tall and 30 pounds at the time. But, um, <laughs> you know, I would go down in and hang out with him and uh, Mama Virginia and, uh, and Kim and, and, and Ebony and the rest of the family. And, you know, one thing that Martina did, which was important to me as an organizer, is she didn't just tell me that her brother was innocent. She took me around the neighborhood. She took me around the city. So I got to meet a lot of Troy's teachers and coaches and the elders in the community. And, you know, it was, if nothing else, if I didn't know anything else about, you know, what was going on, just the words from the elders alone, you know, it was, it was evident and it was confirmation that, that, you know, this was a uh, serious move. So long story short, you know, um, you know, got close with the family. Um, then 2011 happened and, you know, it was the three funerals and, you know, we'll, we'll go from there, but that's kind of my introduction. And of course I spoke to Troy numerous times on the phone and wrote the letters and all of that. And, um, you know, it was like, it was like he was never locked up to me. It was, you know, we was speaking like it was somebody down the street, you know? Dejan, what does it feel like to have this extended family um, beyond your own? And your mother was such a deep inspiration as we can hear everyone talking about Troy and Martina in the same breath. Uh, Kimberly, of course, still so important. Um, what it means to have all of these people and a movement 10 years later, does that give you hope? Um, it, it definitely gives me hope, but at the same time, um, with many of these people on here, we were able to, you know, have not only a bond through the death penalty, but just a bond actually, um, on a personal level, um, like me, uh, the Jawe, Kalanji, like Mark, we, I've been knowing a lot of them for a long time now. So and I know at any given time, if I actually, you know, needed to pick up a phone call and call them, I could. I mean, I talk to most of them on Facebook all the time. We interact with each other. So it was more so, you know, not only having the, you know, the relationship from a death penalty standpoint and getting, you know, having one common goal to, uh, abolish the death penalty one day um, but we were able to like I said make family bonds and that's my, my one thing that's so important as well um, you know especially with our family because everyone knows when you meet us 
we're very open people, very down to earth. Um, and, you know, we were definitely willing to do whatever needs to get done to, you know, help make situations better. Um, we're not a selfish group of people. And I think that's what, you know, allowed so many people to gravitate towards us as a family um, because we showed everyone the same love and opportunity to be loved. Um, and that's what was so very important about Troy uh, because it started with him. Um, he was always been that type of person um, who was willing to, you know, like I said, go the extra mile, uh, get that clothes off his, you know, give his clothes off his back to whoever may need it. Um, and, you know, we all just took that same aura, that same energy. And I mean, just like, like I said, just got passed through the family. Um, and like I said, it just, it just means, it means a lot, uh, especially with like I said, over the last 10 years, having everyone still come around and still be engaged and still be involved, not just with Troy Davis stuff, but taking that message to go forth and, you know, with other families and especially like Ms. Perez and, you know, her situation, just, you know, praying for people in, in Texas and doing what we can to help better the next situation. Um, and so that's what, you know, it's so good that, when the I am Troy Davis name was started, like Kalanji said, you know, just a figure thought that came on mother's head along with some people from Anim scene, just had a marker and a couple of people write it on a shirt. But the message itself was just so powerful because, you know, like the gentleman said earlier, um, he is Troy Davis. Anybody could be Troy Davis. And that was the whole point of it. Like at any given time, um, no matter what day, what year it is, anybody could be Troy Davis. But like he said, having people to fight for you and just believe in your cause on the outside and fight for you just as much as, you know, they may, we may not even be blood, but, you know, I don't give 110% into your cause, into your case, because I believe in you. And that's what's most important. Mark, here we are still in the midst of the pandemic. You yourself got COVID, um, but the organizing continues. Uh, you have, President Biden, who says he's against the death penalty, you know, uh, religiously, personally, um, it means there's an opening at the very top. But what do you think is the most important way to organize in your years of doing it now? I mean, maybe before in the White House, it, it was a brick wall. And now the door, it's a door that's open a crack. But what do you think is the most strategic way Vangelis this morning said, if you get more than 25 states and we're at something like, what, 23 and Virginia, the last one, the first state in the South to abolish the death penalty, the Supreme Court could rule it's um, cruel and unusual. Yeah, I mean, it's a great it's a great question. Um, I, I begin by expressing my deep skepticism of the Biden administration's commitment um, to opposing in any meaningful way the death penalty. As I watch our Haitian brothers and sisters being um, abused, harassed, beaten, um, treated in the most despicable ways possible. I mean, it's a moral atrocity what's happening at the border under the oversight of an administration that said that they would have a humane border policy, that they would have a humane immigration policy. We'll, we'll make sure you have a safe way in turns into don't come when, 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 when the tide shifts. My point in bringing that up is to say that I have no reason to believe that they will ever be motivated by anything other than their own political aspirations, their own political interests, not any kind of moral or ethical commitment. Um, and that's not particular to Biden-Harris, it just includes Biden and Harris. And so I begin, so, so th there might be a crack in the door, but it could also be, be slammed shut at any given moment. And so my hope doesn't reside in the democratic turn or capital D democratic turn in Washington. It resides in the people as it always has. I think that the state by state local or and really city by city even, but the state by state local organizing that has happened uh, around this country has, has, has been one of the most effective and important tactical strategies toward ending the death penalty. Uh, the, the, the putting the spotlight on these, these awful cases um, um, of, of, um, of, um, of, of people being executed with, with, sh with shaky evidence, also pointing out the people who have been um, exonerated, sometimes posthumously, they, they, they die and then we realize we got DNA. Then we realize that the witness lied, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. This is the kind of stuff that, that, that shifts public sentiment. 
right? You know, when we argue against the death, death penalty, when I argue against the death penalty, I always say that our, our tactically our strategies have to be threefold. Um, one point here is, of course, to say the policy it may be before, the policy is racist, is disproportionately applied. Um, unfortunately, in a world that doesn't care about black people, that's not always persuasive. Um, we have to point out the fact that it doesn't work. You know, so many people argue that if we just could kill more people, people would stop killing people. That type of bizarre circular argument is not only illogical, but again, it doesn't work. We get it wrong. I often find that the people who don't care about the first two arguments believe that if we get it wrong this much, I always ask people, what percentage would you be comfortable? Let's say it was 10%. Would you be okay with killing one out of 10 people who didn't do it? Most people will at that point stop and say, oh, I guess I wouldn't be. And when you look at the rate, rates for looking at the Innocence Project, when you look, I mean, you could go across the board and see all the evidence that shows that we get it wrong a lot. And so I find that pointing, tactically pointing out these cases, and that's my job in the media, that's our job, Amy, in the media, right, is to point out these cases. And then finally to say that America doesn't have the moral authority to kill its citizens. No nation that, that is engaged in settler colonialism, slavery, uh, Jim and Jane Crow, uh, Tuskegee experiment, we're going down the list has the moral authority to decide who gets to live or die. I think if we deploy each of those arguments in different spaces, but are committed to all of them as tactical strategies, um, I think we can be victorious in the struggle against the death penalty, but it has to happen through local organizing. I don't have faith in the Supreme Court as Roe v. Wade's about to be redecided. I don't have faith in the White House as the atrocities are happening at the border, but I have faith that if we organize, we can shift public sentiment. And because politicians don't have feelings, they have interests. If we're organizing enough at the state level, we can shift their interest to meet our political needs and our ethical needs. Well, as we begin to wrap up, because I know that um, the evening has been long, but there are just so many amazing people that are here joining this uh, and just listening and commenting in the chat. I wanted to ask Tenji Wei to give us final thoughts on movement building and where we go from here. Sure, I just wanna um, touch on something that Mark just said, just about how fundamental any social movement needs to, needs to have an analysis around the death penalty. There's nothing more perverse or disturbing to, to not, just like, not just engage in state san sanction assassinations, but to give someone a day in time where you will take their life and then call it justice. There's nothing, there's nothing more morally corrupt and disturbing and perverse than that idea. And then also to have people, a population of people consider that as actual, as actual justice. And so it's fundamental to any social movement, whether it's economic violence or, um, and to like police brutality to, to consider the role of the death penalty. In terms of where social movements are now, you know, we are at a convergence of what many call a multiple crises happening at the same time. We have everything from economic violence that we are watching um, in terms of so many of our people are suffering economically and financially, while there are a small group of people who have, ne who have accumulated wealth at a level we have never seen before. This is something that is so significant that we have to understand the, the state of racial capitalism and where it is now. And then what we're seeing is the criminalization of black people in their communities or at the border. The, the signs of the whips are an indication that black bodies are made to be subjugated for the purposes of wealth accumulation and that there needs to be a level of order to, in order to criminalize poverty. And so what we have, whether it's climate, the pandemic, all of these things are happening together. It's a convergence of multiple crises. Someone said to me today, it's almost like the 68, 69 moment. We are watching something significant happening. But I think what I'm so reminded of when I think about the movement to prevent Joy Davis's case and also this family is, well, is that while we are at a moment of great threat and great challenge, we are all also seeing the most powerful, I believe, moment in history where you are watching a, the radicalization of billions of people around the planet who not only want simple reforms, but they actually want to transform the society so that there is no more Troy Davis, there is no more Trayvon Martin, there is no more Jordan Davis, there is no Breonna Taylor, that it, it requires a complete transformation. And I think what's required for our movement is to put forth the most boldest vision that is goes beyond the forms and actually says ab abolish, not just abolish a death penalty, but abolish every single thing that stands in the way for the freedom of our people and that continues to kill us.
I was supposed to wrap up the panel, but I think Tenji Wei said it better than I ever could. Oh, I was about and, to say, sheesh, <laughs> we can go out there. Um, um, but as we throw it back to Jen Marlowe, I still wanted to give the very final word back to Dejan. Um, I remember Dejan when you were, to say the least, much younger, coming into our firehouse studio um, with your mom, uh, being interviewed, and I thought, the dignity, I mean, to say young man, you were just a little boy. And the idea that this is the life you grew up in. This is the movement that was the landscape of your life and what you want to see happen now. Well, um, yeah, I mean, uh, I wouldn't even say unfortunately. I'm actually, you know, they always say things happen to certain people for a reason and things of that nature. Um, and I never looked at the situation of, you know, me being the nephew of Troy Davis or let alone the family of Troy Davis as um, a negative. Granted, you know, a lot of negativity came from it, a lot of heartbreak, a lot of sorrow. We, I get all that. But at the same time, um, you know, you're never faced with anything that you can't overcome. Um, and, you know, we, like I said, we had a strong foundation of people who was behind us. Um, and our main goal, which is what we actually accomplished, uh, was to just bring more light on the Georgia death penalty and let alone just the death penalty as a whole. Um, and we accomplished that and then some. Um, granted, yes, Troy was not um, let free from prison or, you know, things of that nature, but the light that he shed on the system itself and bringing so many people like, you know, people like who are here now and just inspiring us and not only just within the death penalty, but in our own ways of life, because yes, we all connect to that, the, the death penalty level, but at the same time, we all have our own, you know, past in life that we were able to take, you know, what Troy was about and what he preached was about, um, preached about to our own lives, like every one of us have done so far. Um, and for me personally, like, you know, like I said, I went after 2011. Um, that was actually that time frame from like 2011 to 2013. Um, I was able to kind of just, in a way, decompress from everything because everything was always going so fast. It was just nonstop Troy stuff, Troy stuff. And at the time, I was like maybe what six or seven to all the way till 17, 16, 17, um, and. You know, like I told my mother when she had passed, she was like, she said, you know, now, you know, I want you to go off and, you know, be in school and do what's best for you. Uh, she said, you know, I always preach that to you, but, you know, you have the knowledge, you have everything that you need. Yes, I won't be here physically, but I'll be there spiritually. Um, and that's what, you know, always pushed me through because at the end of the day, like I said, and, and people who knew uh, seeing me, my mother always, they knew, they know the relation that we had, they know the connection that we had. So it was always like nip and tuck. Um, and, you know, I was able to take that along, you know, it's like go to the Morehouse, graduate from Morehouse, a degree in physics and everything, and then move on and um, get my engineering lifestyle together. And like I said, it was never a time of, um, you know, being angry, being sad. Uh, I just had so much joy because. You know, we as a family we were so tight. Um, they taught us, taught me so much information. And like I said, leaning back on people like yourself who are in this group, who are maybe not in this group on Zoom right now, um, but having a support system like that, that, that helps a lot um, in the long run. Um, and, you know, like I said, when I can call on Kalanji at any time and I can crack on him and how old he is, like that helps me, you know. And you know, it, it take it goes it goes a long way. But uh, like I said, I'm I'm very appreciative of everyone who's you know been with us and with the family for over these years and who are continue to working with us and continue to doing things. And um, just to let everyone know that uh, we are here for you. It's our turn. Um, to be here for you. That's what's most important. Yes, this is about Troy, but now the name is different. It's not Troy Davis. It's I am blank. And unfortunately, that's sad to say, but we have to keep it real like it is. Um, and we have to be ready to, you know, put on our shiniest shoes, put our backpacks on, put our, you know, put our britches up and get the marching and do what we have to do. And, um, you know, we all 
had the opportunity to speak Troy's name and, you know, it was glorious. It was fun. But, you know, at the moment, and I'm using Ms. Perez um, as an example right now, you know, we have to speak her family um, into the action, like, you know, bring her family the same energy that we brought into this, you know, bring into her family and bring into others around. Um, and the people here that's on that panel have been continuously doing that over the past 10 years continuously and will continue to do that. Um, and I will say that, you know, please don't hesitate to reach out to the family to ask for support and ask for different help and different things. We were definitely willing to do it. We're definitely willing to be a voice to the voiceless um, because we understand that uh, without you all, we wouldn't be where we are today. Um, and, you know, it takes a team, it takes a village to really bring up everyone and really make a movement. Um, and that's what we have to continue to do. That's what the whole vision of I Am Troy is about, being one with another, understanding when injustices are happening and be there to, you know, step in and do what's right. Um, and like, you know, <clears throat> Mark said, it's a lot of stuff going on upstairs. And, you know, we got to be vigilant. We got to be keep our eyes open. We got to understand what's going on. And I was definitely taken back from that pictures I seen what happened in that in instant was that Texas, I believe, I think it was. Um, Del Rio, and, Texas. Yeah. And I'm I'm just I'm I'm sitting here like, is this something out of a Western? Like, what what the devil is this? But that's too, I'm I'm like, am I in 2011 or am I in, you know, 1970 or something? But you know, that's the world that we live in. And uh, you know, as I don't mean to be long-winded, but like I said, the, the importance of this conversation of moving forward is to realize that. Is not just I am Troy Davis, it's I am blank, I am question mark, and being there for the voiceless, and we're here to do that. And I just want to thank everyone for being here, thank everyone for supporting us throughout the years, and continue to know that, you know, we're strong as a family, we're good, and we're here to help you. We're here to be a voice for the voiceless in other ways as well. Thank you. Show a picture of my brother. Oh. Well, thank you yeah, so yeah. much to that, everyone. You said that's a picture. That's a picture of who, of who? Yeah, that's my brother, Luis Castro Perez. Thank you so much for your kind words, sweetheart. We love yes, you. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. I am Lewis. I am Lewis. Thank you. Dejan, you've come a long way, man. I used to change your pampers, man. I'm proud of you, brother. <laughs> you know. <laughs> listen, proud of you. Listen, listen. I potty trained you in anything. You my man. Listen. I, I, I just want to add on real quick. You said it's something out of a Western. It is. It's something out of Western imperialism. We got to always keep that in mind. Boom. You know what I mean? That's what hey, it's all about listen, right now. there, my man. Well, on that note, we're going to send it back to the remarkable organizer, Jen Marla. Thank you. Wow, Amy and Dejan and Delia, Tanjiwe, Mark Kalunji. I, um, I, it would take many more minutes than we have for me to talk about the ways each of you have motivated and inspired me um, in, in ways that we have um, connected and, and worked together and organized together and struggled together. And, um, so all I'll say is uh, when you get a moment, look at the chat column because you can see how deeply you are motivating and inspiring and resonating with uh, the 200 people who have been able, 200 plus people who were able to join us tonight. So um, thank you for giving me what I know I needed to wake up tomorrow and to um, continue to be deeply in struggle and, and to be both outraged, but um, struggling in love. Uh, so huge. Thank you. Um, one thing I do want to mention uh, that tonight uh, this event was free with donation options, optional. And if anyone did not yet donate, but they feel moved to, and I think uh, BK is going to drop the link in the chat and then you see it up on the screen. Um, uh, proceeds for tonight are going to get split between um, the, uh, the education for the Davis family. A lot of folks in this room had been involved in, in the support for Dejan when he was at Morehouse. Um, and we've got 13-year-old uh, Kirsten and baby Bella coming up, uh, coming up ahead of us who will be having uh, educational opportunities of their own. So support will go to the Davis uh, children. And, um, and then the other half of the support will go towards the, the I Am Troy Davis project. So we can uh, continue, we can finish the film, we can continue the performance project, and we can continue uh, supporting the Davis family uh, to amplify the work um, in all of the possible ways. Can I say one more thing real quick? Please. 
Um, I just want to, uh, speaking of uh, all the donations, I do want to say thank you to everyone over the years who I have constantly donated to me and my family, and especially to my college fund. Um, it definitely didn't go unnoticed. Um, I, like I said, I graduated with a degree in physics, minor in math, and became an engineer. Um, and, you know, it's, it's things that have been going exceptionally well um, because you guys have been blessing me and my family and with prayers and just even just uh, speaking to me from time to time and just get my mind going back uh, sometimes when I may, you know, slip track or whatever. But um, I do want to say to my everyone who's here, I really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Um, and without you, uh, I couldn't have done it and couldn't have become a man of more highs like I am today. Thanks, Dejan. Um, Morehouse man, it's pretty amazing watching how you have uh, the man you've grown into. Um, and mm -hmm. BK has dropped the link in the chat uh, for folks who are moved to wanna to wanna donate and want to support. Um, and a reminder that for folks who do want to read the book, uh, Haymarket Books is offering at a 40% discount. And uh, you can find that. Uh, I'll send that link out also over email, um, but it's also in the chat. Um, and there is a form that, uh, that we're dropping uh, that will allow you to provide your reflections on tonight and also um, help us to keep in touch so that we can stay connected in all of these struggles um, and as we're continuing to, to do the work. Um, there is so much more to say, and I recognize that we're that we're at the end of our time. But I do think it's important that the final word tonight uh, will be Troy's words, um, and holding in our hearts tonight, Troy and Martina and their mother Virginia, um, and the entire Davis family, and all the other families uh, who have suffered and are still suffering a similar pain. Um, holding them in our hearts, uh, I want us to listen to the words that Troy spoke to all of us. Um, just as he was being executed. It's Troy's final words. Uh, and it's still hard to believe uh, that it's 10 years ago. Um, so we're, we're gonna listen to his words and then I'm gonna um, reflect, we'll reflect on them for a moment together before we leave. Stand up. First of all, I'd like to trust the Bayer's family. I'd like to let you all know Despite the situation, I know all of you still are convinced that I'm the person that killed your father, your son, and your brother. But I am innocent. The incidents that happened that night was not my fault. I did not have a gun that night. I did not shoot your father. I am so sorry for your loss. I really am sincerely. All that I can ask. That each of you look deeper into this case so that you really will finally see the truth. Thanks to my family and friends, that you all continue to pray, that you all continue to forgive, continue to fight this fight. Those who are trying to, about to take my life, God have mercy on all the soul. God bless you all. Troy asked us in that final message that he gave us to continue to fight this fight. And there's so much that we still need to be fighting. And I just wanna invite us all to take a moment before leaving this gathering um, to think about what's one concrete commitment, each of us individually, each person making their own concrete commitment that we can make our way of continuing to fight this fight. And if you're willing, please use the chat to share what that commitment's gonna be. When, when we leave this Zoom meeting, what's one commitment that you can offer us as a group um, to continuing to fight this fight? Sophie said to read the book and pass it on. To share songs that can be aired on the radio. Um, that's from Carol Newman.
to learn more about Billy Allen and share his stories with other from Taylor, to help to promote the film and the discussions, to be in action every day to stop executions from A. Bonowitz with death penalty action. From Noel in North Carolina to continue to amplify the voices of people most impacted. To have uncomfortable conversations with those who are uncomfortable. To educate, speak with family and friends, show up for folks that are impacted, work harder in Texas to end the death penalty. From Dejan to support those who need it like we were supported. I am, I am, I am. So many beautiful commitments. If folks have a moment, I would say, please um, go ahead and, and look at those commitments, uh, read them, share your own. Raphael is, uh, hi Raphael, saying to try to host a community screening of the film in his neighborhood once it is released. Um, so many amazing commitments. Carol had asked about a song for the radio. I wanna play a song from Rebel Diaz. Some folks might've heard it joining at the countdown when we were joining um, this meeting, uh, but they wrote it right after Troy was executed in the days after execu the, Troy's execution called Troy Davis Lives Forever. So as you're reading everyone's commitments and making your own, also BK is gonna drop the link for the panel, for the, for the form, the survey that you can fill out that will give us your reflections on the evening and help us stay in touch. So as you're filling that out, we can listen to Rebel Diaz and read each other's commitments. Another lynching has gone down in the U.S. And it's 2011. Nothing has changed. What up, Troy? I can't believe you actually did it, man. To tell the truth, they ain't never gonna kill you, man. You live forever with the hearts of those that fought for you. You fought for us, you gave the strength like a true soldier. I feel the pain, I feel the anger, and the race to show it. I hit the streets and spread the word so the world knows it. I'm sorry we ain't safe. Should have been braver, but at times I feel alone when I'm surrounded by these strangers. 2009, we first spoke after I met Martina. I got the shirt, but since then I haven't really seen her. Been on the road with these rats, just trying to spread a message. But when I think about it, talks, they were such a blessing. You was in jail reading your poems on the phone. And all I did was just listen backstage of the show. Then I heard the crazy news about a week ago that the date had been set and they wanted you to go. 11.08 p.m., September 21st. Never forget my end of being still hurts. Obama stayed quiet like he did for us and Grant. Clarence Thomas, bitch ass, never gave you a chance. See, you was innocent. There was too much doubt. Seven of nine witnesses wanted their testimony out. They were scared for these threats, serious like cancer. But you know it wasn't true. Years later, they recanted. I wish I had the answer. What to do next? Got to do more than tweet Facebook and send texts. We need freedom. Who organized like Zulu for the pain of injustice, even though I never knew you? What I'm sure I can't believe they actually did it, man. To tell the truth, they ain't never going to kill you, man. You live forever in the hearts of those that fought for you. You fought for us, you gave us strength like a true soldier. What I'm sure I can't believe they actually did it. Man. To tell the truth, they ain't never gonna kill you, man. You live forever in the hearts of those that fought for you. Yeah. you fought for us, you gave them strength like a true soldier. They still mention from plantations to the prisons. Methods change, but it's the same system. White robes used to burn a crucifix. Now black robes sign a death sentence. Instead of Jim Crow and legal segregation, it's yuppie condos and cuts to education. And I ain't gotta say it, Troy, you said it in your last letter. Thanking your supporters worldwide for the past efforts. More than half a million signed them petitions. The Pope, the Archbishop, stars and politicians. Who's who on Twitter weighing in like Mayweather? But what happens to my bro after the storm let up? New day, pray you in a better place. Over here we cope and trying to channel that rage to a Abolish these legal nations, abolish their broken system, abolish the need for prisons of defense of the human spirit. What's up, Troy? I can't believe that you get it, man. To tell the truth, they ain't never gonna kill you, man. You live forever in the hearts of those that fought for you. You fought for us, you gave the strength like a true soldier. What up, Troy? I can't believe that you get it, man. To tell the truth, they ain't never gonna kill you, man. You live forever in the hearts of those that fought for you. You fought for us, you gave the strength like a true soldier. Like a true soldier. Troy Davis. 
Troy Davis, rest in power. And to echo Dejan, I am, I am, I am. Thank you for being here together to remember, to reflect, to grieve, but also to commit to the fight. <laughs>